Let's turn today to the book of Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 as we continue our message series entitled Filled. While you turn there, I just want to welcome our guests. We're so glad that you've chosen to come and to be with us today. We hope you feel welcomed and comfortable and at home like this is family. Because if you're a son or daughter of God, we are family. We share, as we sang a moment ago, the blood of Christ which runs through our veins. Not literally, right? But we're talking about the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sin. So we have a common spirit, and I hope that you feel that spirit in this room today. Also, we welcome those joining us online. We hope God speaks to you powerfully today through his word also, and that uh, he just encourages you and gives you comfort and peace in whatever challenge you're facing and whatever it is today that keeps you at home. We hope that you can join us on a future Sunday here at the Circle Church. Romans chapter 8, we're just going to read a few verses, and then we're going to see what the Spirit of God has to say to his church. Beginning in verse 15. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you've received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we also may be glorified with him. This is God's word for us today. Never forget 2007, August the 21st, being in the hospital and the first time hearing the cry of my son. It was such a precious moment to see his eyes open and for him to know that one of the first things that he was seeing was mom and dad. If you've ever been there, you know how powerful it is to see a child, a life brought in this world, and you know it's a gift from God. I mean, we all have a part in the conception of our children, but the reality is that the powers that are at work, they transcend our ability to explain or comprehend. I mean, God has put things in place. God has made things possible that we could never envision with all of our science and with all of our technology. God has allowed us to enjoy the gift of sonship and of having children. And the Bible teaches us that in the same way God births men and women into his family, that he allows us to become sons and daughters of God. And while we understand some of it, we cannot understand all of it. And yet God has given us enough. He's helped us to understand as much as we need to understand to be a part of his family. And at the end of the day, that is all that matters. So before we go any further in this message today, I just want to say, That as we speak today about being sons and daughters of God, there are so many questions that we might have, so many curiosities that are out there, so many what-ifs and what-abouts, and there is no way that I can answer all of those things, not just because time is not enough, but because the revelation that God has given us in all of these areas is not enough. And yet we know that God's revelation is sufficient. It is enough in the sense that it's everything we need for life and godliness. So what I want you to understand today at the close of the message is that God has made a way for you to be called his child, and that the way that he has made for you to be called his child, his son or daughter, was paved by his son, Jesus Christ, who walked in the same shoes that he now wants you to walk in. And while we know Jesus was exceptional, unusual even, the Bible teaches us that his example is not to be abnormal, but it's one that we all follow. It is relatable. And what allowed Jesus to do what he did and what affirmed him in his title, Son of God, was nothing more than the Holy Spirit. And so what we're going to do, we're going to close by coming back to Romans 8. But along the way, we're going to explore the life of Jesus and how the power of the Spirit of God is what made him who he was. So let's turn to the book of Luke the book of Luke, and what I want to do with you is I want to give you sort of a brief biography of Jesus' history as the Son of God. And when I speak about Jesus' history as the Son of God, I'm talking about within space and time. We're not going to go back into prehistory because we do believe that Jesus is the Word of God who has always been. But we're not going to explore his existence in his pre-incarnate state. We're going to explore his existence as he came into this world, because I can relate with that, and you can relate with that, because we are in this world, and Jesus became flesh just as we are. And so here's the million-dollar question. 
How is Jesus able to live out his identity as the Son of God in the world, living as he did in the likeness of sinful flesh? Has the question ever occurred to you? I mean, we think about the benefits. We think about the advantages that Jesus had because he was the Son of God. And he was. But let's not forget what it says in the book of Philippians. That Jesus, when he came to this earth, emptied himself. Now, we talk about that word empty. It means exactly what you think. It means he pulled the plug and everything that he had in the way of rights and prerogatives as divinity was drained from him. He intentionally, on purpose, by an act of his will, allowed himself to be drained of his rights and prerogatives as God. And so as he walked in this life, as he went through this world, he did so as a man. Now, he was still the Son of God. He is the God-man, fully God and fully man, yet living out this fleshly existence without accessing those advantages, without accessing those benefits, without saying, well, I'm the Son of God, so therefore I can do this, or I'm the Son of God, so therefore I can do this. It's sort of like the question we have, what was Jesus like as a child? Was he sort of like, you know, I'm the Son of God, I can do whatever? And so I'm just going to jump off of a roof and land on my feet just to impress some girl. Well, no, no, no. Jesus didn't do that kind of stuff. He didn't access those things that he could have done because he wanted to live the life that God intended us to live by the same rules so he could do what we couldn't do, so that we could become what he is. What is it that allowed Jesus, emptied as he was, to live out his identity as the Son of God? It was the Holy Spirit, y'all. And the same spirit that God gave Jesus, God makes available to us. And so I want to show you how the spirit of God played such a vital role in the life of Jesus. And we're going to begin in Luke chapter 1, verses 30 through 35. These are verses we read around Christmas time, but we're going to read them again. It says, The angel said to her, that's Mary, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call him Jesus. He'll be great, and he'll be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He'll reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, And for that reason, the holy child shall be called the Son of God. So what does the angel say to Mary? He gives her a threefold announcement. You will conceive, you will bear, and you will name. You will conceive a child. You will bear him to full term. And when he comes, you will give him a name. That's what you'll do, Mary. And God says to the angel, here's what I will do. I will give him the throne of his father, David. And as a result, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and ever and ever. Now, we need to understand what is going on here. What God is doing is God is tapping into Jewish messianic expectation. That sounds really big. Who are the Jews? They're just the people of God chosen by God, the offspring of Abraham. Who's the Messiah? The anointed one of God. And expectation just means looking forward to something. You see, the Jews of Jesus' day were looking for a Messiah. Isn't that wild? They were looking for the Messiah. And here's the tragedy. They're still looking. Even though God sent Jesus. But what God tells Mary through the angel is that God is fulfilling the messianic expectations of his people. That what he is going to do for her is he is going to give her a child who will be called the Son of the Most High, who will be given the throne of his father David, and who will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Not for a limited period of time, not for a single term in office, but forever and ever and ever. If you were to read 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 11 through 16, you would find God promising David something. David, in this chapter, purposes to build God a house, a temple. But God says, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool, so how can you build a house big enough for me? You ever thought about that? Like we talk about this being the house of God, 
But God's throne is in heaven, his footstool's on earth. We can't build a church big enough to contain God. And so God said to David, you know, I really appreciate it, David, but you're not going to build a house for me. Here's what's going to happen. I am going to build a house for you. After you die, I will raise up my offspring, or your offspring, and he will build a house for me. I will make him great, and his throne will endure forever. Now, the son of David was Solomon, and he did build God a house, and he did have a good reign. But here's the thing. Solomon's line was broken. In 586 B.C., the Jews were carried off into exile. And so the promises to God, of God to David were not fulfilled. And so what the Jews began to expect is that the promises of God were not fully fulfilled in Solomon, and so they will be fulfilled one day in one who comes after him. One who is also a descendant of David, but one who will reign perpetually. They took this from passages like Isaiah 9-6 and Daniel 7-13 that speak about the government of one who would come, whose government would last forever and forever and forever. They began to anticipate the arrival of a Messiah who would reign in an everlasting way, and he would do so by perfectly expressing the will of God. Of God. And so when God makes these promises to Mary, what he's doing is he is tapping into Jewish messianic <clears throat> expectation. He's saying that the promised Messiah, Mary, is going to come through you. Now, there's one thing about this that I want to point out before we look at how God fulfills it. And that is in the Old Testament, the idea was that God adopted the Davidic king as his own son. I want to show this to you in Psalm chapter 2 and verse 7. If you would hold your spot there in Luke. And let's turn to Psalm 2, 7. I want to show you what the phrase Son of God meant in a first century context. Today we hear and we think, well, it's Jesus, of course, the Son of God, who's always been. But that's not the way they thought of it in the first century. They thought of it like this. Psalm 2, 7. It says, I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. The Psalms are the hymn book of Israel. And like our hymns, they contain a lot of theology. And in this particular hymn, this particular psalm, we find a very important statement. Here's what we believe about this psalm. We believe that Psalm 2 was a psalm that was written over the king on the day of his coronation. In other words, on the day that the king of Israel was coronated, this psalm would be recited. It would be said. And here's what the king, on the day of his coronation, would say. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And so here's the idea. The king of Israel, who was a descendant of David, on the day of his coronation, was adopted as if he became God's own son. And if you're a history buff, you know that this kind of stuff happens. I mean, if you think about the Roman Empire, right? Caesar Augustus, the first emperor of Rome. He had some kids of his own, but they all died. I mean, this was the tragedy. He lived to an old age, all his kids died. The guy who succeeded him, the emperor Tiberius, was not his son. He adopted him as his own son. And if you think about Caesar Augustus, he was not the son of Julius Caesar, not naturally. And yet because Julius Caesar had no son of his own, he adopted Caesar Augustus as his own son. These things happened all the time in the ancient world. And in a polytheistic pagan society, kings justified their rule by saying, well, I am the son of God. They believed that on the day they became king, that the God adopted them as their own son. Now, here's the thing. The Bible uses this same sort of language to speak about the king of Israel. That on the day of his coronation, the king of Israel became, was adopted as the son of God. Now, this doesn't mean he became Jesus. It doesn't mean he became all-powerful. It doesn't mean he could walk on water. But he was adopted as God's, hear me, God's representative on earth, who was meant to follow the will of his father and do as his father told him to do. Because in the Bible, 
your father was truly the person you honored and obeyed. You see, if you didn't honor and obey your father, you're treating him as if he's not your father. And so in honoring and obeying God, the king of Israel was acting as his son. And this is the way they thought about it. And so when the angel speaks to Mary and says, the child who will be conceived in you will be the son of the Most High, a Jew, upon hearing that, would think, okay, the child that she has will be adopted by God as his son, just like the kings of Israel were. All we have is a human king who is going to be treated as the son of God. But what Luke does is he takes this so much farther. For look at verse 34. We're back in Luke 1. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? I love it. I love the honesty of the question. How can this be? How can I have a child like what you're saying? Now, on the one hand, the answer to her question is obvious because she was betrothed to this guy named Joseph. And if you know anything about Joseph, Luke 1.27 tells us, he was a son of David. And so it makes sense. Why would she even ask the question? How can I become pregnant, have a son who will inherit the throne of David? Well, duh, because I'm marrying Joseph. And one day, Joseph will help me to have a child for him, and that child will be a son of David, blah, 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 blah. But Mary understands there's a greater immediacy to the angel's words. That what he is saying is coming upon her rapidly, and not by the natural means. And so she asks, how can this be? And the angel answers her in verse 35. He answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason the Holy Child will be called the Son of God. How can it be that I will bear a child who will be the Son of the Most High? Not by the usual means. The Spirit of God will come upon you, the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and that's why he'll be called the Son of God. So we're not talking about a natural birth where God takes a mere man and adopts him as his representative on earth to do the best he can with the time that God allots him. No. What the writer Luke is teaching us is that the child conceived in her would be human because he comes from Mary. And yet he will be divine because he is the product of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was the Son of God because of the Holy Spirit. Had he not been conceived by the Holy Spirit through the Virgin Mary, he would not, he could not be the Son of God in the sense that we believe him to be the Son of God. The doctrine of the virgin birth of Jesus is under attack today. There are people who doubt it, who dispute it, who question it. And there are believers who would say, what difference does it make? I mean, why does it matter if Jesus was born of a virgin? All that matters is that a guy named Jesus was born and that a guy named Jesus did some pretty amazing things and then died on the cross. Here's why it matters. Because if Jesus was not conceived of the Holy Spirit the way the Bible teaches, he's just a man, y'all. He's just a man like you. He's just a man like me. And he is not qualified to be our Savior. But you may say to yourself, but virgins don't conceive. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it just doesn't happen that way. And yet when God works, wouldn't you agree? When God works in a central, pivotal way in history, we can expect to God to, to, for God to work in an unusual way. And the unusual nature and circumstances of Jesus' birth are not proof against its reality, but are proof of his divine origin, of who he was, of where he came from, that he is the Son of God. Why is Jesus the Son of God? He is the Son of God, we're taught in this passage, not because of his coronation, if you will, like a Davidic king, but as a result of his conception which was itself the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at another passage, Luke chapter 3. Turn over to Luke 3, verse 21 and 22. 
So in Luke 3, we get to Jesus' baptism. I'll never forget the day I was baptized. I was saved at the age of 11, but I had been baptized at 7 after a conversion experience that I later realized I wasn't ready for yet. And sort of thinking, well, I've already been baptized because I was baptized at 7, even though I was saved at 11. I just wasn't baptized after my conversion. And around 18, I realized, wait a minute, the order is saved, baptized. And so I was baptized by my dad. And it was, it was awesome. It was incredible. Like some people think, what does it matter? I mean, why should I get baptized after my conversion? I can't explain it to you. But really special things happen in your life when you obey God. And the first thing God tells you to do after you're saved is to follow him in baptism. And I want to show you something really special God did for Jesus on the occasion of his baptism. Luke 3, 21. It says, now when all the people were baptized... Jesus was also baptized. And while he was praying, heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him. Gosh, this mic's going to drive me nuts. Probably y'all too. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came out of heaven, you are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. Now, this passage relates to us the baptism of Jesus. But it's really not that concerned about Jesus' baptism. I mean, it doesn't go into a lot of the details about how Jesus was baptized. Instead, what it focuses on is Jesus' endowment with the Holy Spirit and God's affirmation of his sonship. And we're told that these things happened not while Jesus was being baptized, but they happened while Jesus was praying, after he had been baptized. So Jesus is baptized, right? And then having come up out of the water, at some point afterwards, he starts praying. And while he's praying, we are told, get the order, heaven was opened, the Spirit descended, and a voice came out of heaven. Now the order is important. Heaven is opened. And by heaven, we're not saying the clouds parted. We're talking about heaven, the abode of God. And after heaven is opened, the Spirit of God descends. From where? From heaven. This is the Spirit from heaven. And a voice speaks. From where? From heaven, which has just been opened. So here's the idea. The Spirit is from heaven. The voice is from heaven. So what can we rightly infer about what the voice says about the guy praying who's just been baptized? That he's from heaven too. That at this moment, heaven is opening and revealing the identity of this individual. And how does God demonstrate that this guy in the water who is praying right now is the Son of God? By him doing some miracle? By him doing something that we can't explain him doing as a man? No, God did it by allowing the Spirit of God to descend upon him. The Spirit was the mark of who Jesus was. And having sent the Spirit, then the voice speaks, you are my beloved Son. In you, I am well pleased. The Spirit comes, the voice speaks. And what is the message? This is my Son. How do we know he's the Son? Because he was baptized? Listen, people get baptized all the time. And baptism by itself will not save you. Baptism by itself does not make you a child of God. There's nothing magical about water. But in that act of obedience, God, this is so wild, but God imparts his spirit. And the spirit of God that conceived Jesus, now we find it descending on Jesus and God affirming his identity as the Son of God. So once again, Jesus is the Son of God, not as a result of his having assumed the throne of David like some of these guys in the past, but he is the Son of God as a result of his commission, because God is commissioning Jesus in this moment, as we will see, and this commission is a result of the miraculous work of the Spirit. Again, you may think, well, Jesus is the Son of God just because he came from heaven, and yeah, But what made him the Son of God on earth? How did that continue in him when he had emptied himself of his divine status? It was the Spirit that God gave at his conception. 
It was the spirit that God gave at his commission. And number three, it was the spirit that God gave on the day that he vindicated who his son was. Look at Luke 24. We'll look at this, then we'll get to some application. Luke 24. May our hearts burn as we realize who our Lord is and what made him who he was. So a little background here, Luke 24. We're told that on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, some women who had seen Jesus die and who had seen where Jesus was buried came to the tomb where he had been buried to anoint his body. But when they arrived at the tomb, they found that the stone that had covered the entrance had been rolled away, and they didn't find the body in the tomb. And while they're looking at this, thinking, what has happened? The Bible says that two men in white stood beside them. And when they saw the men, they fell on the ground and were afraid. And the men asked them a question. I love this. The question that they asked them is in verse 5, Luke 24. Why do you seek the living one among the dead? Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be, number one, delivered into the hands of sinners, number two, be crucified, and number three, on the third day, rise again. And so once again, we find angels with a message for women. The Bible is a book of empowerment over women. It is not a chauvinistic book. It's not a male-dominated book. What we find is that the ministry, the career of Jesus is bookended by angelic proclamations to women. No, the Bible holds women in high regard, and the message here, however, not the person, is what is of primary importance. And it's what the women testified to, that this Jesus is not here but has been raised because of the word he spoke that he had to be delivered over, that he had to be crucified, and he had to be raised. Now, let me ask you a few questions. Who delivered Jesus over? Because if you think about these three verbs, the Son of Man must be delivered, he must be crucified, he must be raised. All of them are passive. And what that means is he's not doing the crucifying, he's not doing the delivering, he's not doing the raising. He is being delivered over, he is being crucified, he is being raised raised. So you see, they're all passive. All of this is stuff that is happening to Jesus. Who delivered him over? Well, we know who it was. It was Judas Iscariot, right? The traitor, the one who betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. Who was it? Who crucified Jesus? Well, we know it was sinful men, namely the Jewish authorities and the Roman authorities who had governance over them. But here's a really good question. Who raised Jesus? I mean, did Jesus raise himself? He's the Son of God, after all, right? Doesn't he have the power to raise himself? And maybe this is the way some of us think about it. Well, Jesus raised himself the same way that he did miracles, the same way he walked on water, the same way he lived a sinless life, because he's the Son of God, and as the Son of God, he can do whatever he wants. And so, because he can do whatever he wants, he can raise himself from the dead. But the Bible doesn't teach that Jesus raised himself from the dead. The Bible teaches something very different. Look at the book of Acts, chapter 2, and verse 32. Different book, same author. The writer Luke writes both Luke and Acts. Acts 2.32, we find Peter preaching at Pentecost. What does he say about Jesus? This Jesus, God raised again. A fact to which we are all witnesses. So what does Peter say? Judas can betray him, human beings can kill him, but only God can raise him. Only the power of the Father. But how did God raise him? Wouldn't you have loved to have been there and to see it? How awesome would that have been? How did God do it? Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1. One of the most incredible passages you will read in the New Testament. Underline it. (laughs) Meditate upon it. Romans chapter 1 and verse 4, it tells us that Jesus was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead 
according to the spirit of holiness. What is the spirit of holiness? Many have speculated. Some have said, well, it was Jesus' holy, pure spirit. The fact that he was so pure and undefiled by the power of his pure and undefiled life, death could not hold him. So it had something to do with Jesus and his life. But what we believe is that Paul sets up two categories, flesh, spirit, kingdom of the world, kingdom of God, sin, righteousness, death, life. And so here, when Paul speaks about being raised by the spirit of holiness, what we mean is that he died in the realm of the flesh, but now has been raised in the realm of the spirit. And that doesn't mean Jesus was only experiencing a spiritual resurrection, as if his body was not also raised. Because in the same way sin not only affects our physical body, it affects our spiritual condition. And so when we live in the flesh, it affects us, body, soul, and spirit, in the same way. Through the spirit, Jesus was affected, body, soul, and spirit. His mind was revived. His soul was enlivened, and his body came to life. Who did it? God. How did God do it? He did it through the Spirit. What am I trying to get at in all this? Here's what I'm trying to get at. Jesus did not do what he did on earth because he brought his God toolbox with him from heaven. When Jesus became a man, he emptied himself. He was still fully the Son of God. But the Son of God, who by a choice of his own emptied himself of his rights and prerogatives, and entered into sinful flesh just like you and I. So how was he able to live on earth as the Son of God as he would have lived as the Son of God in heaven? Because you see, many of us are waiting to get to heaven to live fully like sons and daughters of God. Here's the way we think about it. Well, right now I'm in the flesh, I'm on earth, I deal with sin, so I can't help it. I can't help my flaws, my foibles. I can't help my failures. I am just human. Jesus could have said the same thing. He could have said the same thing because he left all of his cheats and he lived, he breathed, he moved in this life by the Spirit. But here's the awesome message. God has given you the same Spirit. Let that sink in for a moment. The same Spirit who conceived Jesus. The same Spirit through whom God commissioned Jesus. The same Spirit that vindicated Jesus is the same Spirit that lives in you. Everybody said, oh, he's not the Son of God, right? Because he died. In fact, to this day, I don't mean this as a slur or a slander, But to this day, if you speak to an Orthodox Jew and ask them, why do you not believe Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah? Here's what they'll tell you. Because he died. And it says in Isaiah 9-7, and it says in Daniel 7-13, that the Son of Man, the Messiah we are looking for, will not die, but he will live forever. And this is why Paul said, If Christ hasn't been raised, we're of all men most to be pitied. This is why the resurrection is the core aspect of our doctrine. And here's how the resurrection happened, by the Spirit. Through the Spirit, God vindicated Jesus. The Spirit was everything for Jesus. The Spirit made Jesus, enfleshed, who he was. And what I want us to grasp this year, and it's going to take some time for it to sink in, For us to be what God says we are and to do what God wants us to do is going to require the same thing that Jesus received and the same thing God has given us, the Spirit. Let me show you that God's given you the same Spirit. First of all, let's talk about the Spirit in your conception, not in your mother's womb, but a different kind. John 3, 5, you guys know the verse, or you at least know the story. Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night, and he says, Good teacher, Rabbi, we know you're from God, because no one can do the miracles you're doing unless God is with him. And what does Jesus say to him? He says, Truly I say to you, 
Unless one is born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. (laughs) Nicodemus sort of scratches his head and says, but how can an old man be born again? I mean, he can't crawl up in his mother's womb again and be born. And Jesus says, wait a minute, I thought you were a teacher of Israel. How is this such a novel concept to you? No, here's what I mean, Nicodemus. Unless you're born of water, and these are debate, it's hard to know exactly what he means by this, but by water I take it to mean a physical birth of some kind. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What is it that makes us children of God? The same thing that made Jesus the Son of God. He was conceived by the Spirit, and so too are you. The moment that your faith is put in Jesus Christ, the moment you cry out to God for redemption, it's not the moment you figured it out, the moment that you finally got over yourself. It is the moment that God, by his Spirit, regenerated you, breathed life into you, and brought you into his family. John 6, 63, it's the Spirit who gives us life. Our flesh doesn't profit us a single thing. We are saved by the Spirit. It is the Spirit coming into our life, flooding our life, which God has made possible, obviously through His Son, that makes us children of God. If you're a child of God, it's because of the Spirit. Let's talk about the Spirit and the commission of the believer. Did you know that God has a commission for you? Now that He saved you, He's got a plan for you. And the same thing is true of Jesus. We've seen it. And one of the interesting things to me about these passages we've explored about Jesus is how similar they are in vocabulary to the stories of Pentecost. Think for a moment about what the angel said to Mary. He said to Mary that the Spirit of the Most High will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Well, what happened at Pentecost? The Spirit of God and the power of God came upon the disciples. And so what happens to Mary in her conception of Jesus is by vocabulary the same basic thing that happened to the apostles, to the disciples at Pentecost. And so we can expect similar effects. What did Mary do after the Spirit of God came upon her and she conceived? Here's what she did. We learned about it in December. We did the message series on carols. She prophesied. The Spirit of God came upon Mary, she conceived, and the Bible tells us she sang a song of thanksgiving to God in the Spirit. What happened to Elizabeth, her kinswoman, when she heard Mary's voice at the door and the baby John leaped in her womb? She was filled with the Spirit. And what did she do? She prophesied. Think about Zacharias, the guy that the angel revealed himself to, but who doubted what the angel had said. When the Spirit of God fills him, what does he do? He prophesies. Think about Simeon. Y'all remember Simeon? What happens when the Spirit of God fills Simeon? He prophesies. Do you see a pattern? Every time the Spirit of God comes upon somebody, they prophesy. And by prophesy, I'm not talking about telling the future. I'm not talking about looking at someone and saying, I'm going to tell you something about you that nobody else knows. Hey, sometimes that happens. But by prophesy, what we mean is this speaking about the mighty acts of God, speaking the gospel of God in a spirit-inspired and empowered way. And this is what the apostles did at Pentecost. And so you have the Spirit and His commission upon the believer. For you see, when the Spirit of God empowers you, when He comes upon you, when He fills you, that is intended for you to speak the Word of God with boldness. And there are many fillings, church. I mean, we're conceived by the Spirit of God once. We are saved once and for all. I mean, Jesus breathed on the disciples and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. But they were still cowering in a corner until the Spirit came at Pentecost. Did they not get the Spirit in John and they did get it in Acts? No, they they had the Spirit in John. But they got a fresh filling at Pentecost. And not only that, but if you look at Acts chapter 4, the Bible tells us, that at a later time, they were praying. And while they were praying, they were filled with the Spirit again. And they began to speak about the mighty acts of God. I mean, is God only giving them like a little bit of His Spirit along the way? No, He just keeps filling them with all of His Spirit at different intervals. I mean, God said, I'm going to put the well in you. 
and he's going to spring up into eternal life? You see, when you have that moment when God just overwhelms you, he overcomes you with power, that's a moment when God is saying, you're my child. And as my child, you're my representative. And as my representative, I want you to share what I have done for you. Gosh, there's so much more I could say about that, but I need to close this. Let's talk about, finally, the spirit and the vindication of the believer. The spirit and the vindication of the believer. You are who you are because of the spirit in you. He conceives you. He gives you birth into the family of God. He commissions you by continually filling you through this life. When you feel empty, he fills you up so you can get off the mat and get back out there and keep doing what God's commanded you to do. But did you know that the Spirit will one day vindicate you? What was the charge brought against Jesus? The charge that said there's no way he can be the Son of God, the Messiah we've been looking for. That Jesus died. And how did God vindicate him? By raising him from the dead through his Spirit. Well, the Bible also teaches that death is still a power that's at work in us. But how is that possible if we've been liberated from the power of death? Because the Bible teaches that we have. There are some people that say, you know, there's no way the Bible's true because for the last 2,000 years, people have been looking for God to come back. Christians keep believing he's coming in their lifetime. And Jesus keeps not coming in their lifetime. And they die. And they're buried. And so it goes. And so the reasoning goes so it will continue to go ad infinitum because all of this is a hoax and all of this is untrue. Did you know the Bible teaches that there is a vindication coming for the believer? When God will vindicate our testimony and our claim. And uh, we read about it in the book of Romans, chapter 8. And I'm going to close out with this. We come back full circle to the book of Romans. Romans 8, 11. It says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Hmm. So what did the spirit do for Jesus? He raised him from the dead, vindicating him. What is the spirit going to do for us one day? raise us from the dead, thereby vindicating us as children of God. Jesus is the first fruits of those who sleep. He's just the first of the resurrection. The resurrection begins with Jesus. It does not end with him. Your future hope, this whole idea of I'm going to go to heaven and be with Jesus when I die, do you know what makes that possible? The Spirit. I am saved by the Spirit I am continually filled and strengthened by the Spirit, and I will one day be vindicated by the Spirit. What makes you a child of God? It's the Spirit's presence in you. And the affirmation that He brings that you are a child of God. And so, as we said last week, the Spirit is not an extra and an add-on The Spirit is the essence of our Christianity. Decreed by the Father, yes. Made possible by the Son, but actualized by the Spirit. And my question is, what does the Spirit's activity in your life say about you? Does His activity in your life say, this is a child of God? Because there's power and authority that cannot be explained by this person. Weak things are not strong. There's not. Foolish things aren't wise. Just not. It's not the way it works. That's not the way it works. Instead, this is God's strength, God's wisdom in a weak and a foolish vessel so that God can display his strength through them. That's Christian living. And that's made possible by the Spirit. Where are you with the Spirit of God? I can't give you the Spirit, but I can tell you about Him. And God stands ready to give Him. And not just once, but a continual, ongoing filling. This is the way we live. It's the way God wants us to live. May we live that way. We're going to sing in a moment. And as we do, we're going to invite the Spirit's presence into our lives more. 
I invite you to respond with me to the Spirit. Would you bow your heads today and close your eyes?